all of the message think about what I have done to you and this will be lessons from Elisha's call and uh, this story of Elisha's call is a wonderful story as Pastor Jennifer was telling a, a picture is really important to help us understand some spiritual truths and that's a, a great great time uh, what happened in this and this time it's a story of hope it's a story of obedience and surrenders. And the story of Elisha is called in 1 Kings chapter 19. Mostly we will be staying there. as a very special message for all of us. And I pray that this morning you will be refreshed of your calling. Either because we all have been called in this room here. If you, if you know Jesus, if you have given your heart to Jesus, if you've been you know, saved and washed, uh, washed by the blood of Jesus of your sin, you have been called already. You have heard that call. Of course, there are other calls that come, specific calls for special service. Uh, but anyway, uh, regardless of if, if you had heard the call many, many years ago, be refreshed this morning. Uh, remind, be reminded of the call, the privilege that you have uh, been called to by the Lord Jesus. And I believe that in this room this morning, as we are all growing as disciples, some of us are specifically being called for a specific task and ministry. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you and point to you and that you will hear His voice calling you this morning. So that story is really, really uh, special. Go to slide number two. We'll just go very quickly on many of the slides this morning, and then we'll do some application. The, this slide here will give you uh, a picture of the dark days in which Elijah and Elisha served. It presents the social and the moral atmosphere of the time. Idolatry, King Ahab, one of the worst king ever that has uh, served uh, Baal for 60 years, like he's been a very long time, he's messed up the country morally and socially. And he did what was evil, he followed the example, the son came to, to rule and he follows his example and uh, God is angry with them, all this. So Elijah served his God before a king and a queen who hated him. That's how they, they, they were serving God. It's not always in the, in the field of rose that God calls us to serve Him. And most of the time it is not a field of rose actually. It's in a difficult situation. But when God calls and someone obeys the word, the word of God, God equips and He will use you regardless of the atmosphere of the time or dark it is. Elijah was a very courageous prophet. He was the only one who declared openly that he was on God's side. Though there were, God told them that there were 7,000 others who did not bow their knees before Baal. But he didn't know that. He thought he was alone on this. And that gives us also an importance of having the support of a faith community. All of you this morning, you are here. You look at the right and the left. Look in the front and the back of you. You have the support of a faith community. And if you look at the story of Elijah, you will see that he felt that he was alone. And because he felt that he was alone, he felt very depressed. If you look at the next slide, you will see how depressed he was. And that uh, slide here, Elijah was afraid because Jezebel had threatened to kill him within a day. So he ran away. If he went to Beersheba in Judah and he left his servants there. And after traveling alone one day in the wilderness, he sat down under a solitary juniper tree and prayed that he might die. That's how discouraged he was. The pressure, the tensions, f tired of fighting and having a government tracking him down, like being persecuted, had to run and fight all the time. And then he tells the Lord, I have enough. Lord, let me die. I have to take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Which is a declaration that he looks at his achievement and he thinks he has not, not done any significant uh, actions. He hasn't changed the nations. He has done anything. He just feels like a total failure. That's what is happening there. So he, uh, he tells God, I have enough, God. So sometimes when you declare something to the Lord, the Lord will do something maybe uh, surprising in answer to that. It's like God says, okay, I heard you. You can go. 
but I have to continue with another one. So I'm choosing another one to replace you. God, because God's never finished. Whether you continue or not, God has a plan and God will complete. And until you read the last chapter of the book of Revelation, God has, will not have finished. And each generation, God has men and women that he calls. You are those that have been called in our generation here. You are in Hong Kong for a reason. You have been called to Lighthouse for a reason. Uh, you have been called to come to God and be part of the kingdom of God for a reason. Whether you feel great or you feel uh, a failure, uh, it doesn't really matter in a way. Because God has called you. And if you refresh your faith and you trust in him, he will restore and he will be using you. Because he has a purpose with, for, with you. Say amen to that. That God has a purpose for you and you have been called. So, so God will continue. So he gives his instructions in the following uh, slide. First Nine, uh, 1915 the Lord replied to him go return to Damascus and then he gives him three missions and the third one is anoint Shaphat's son Elisha from Abel Mehola as a prophet to replace you so very specific uh, instructions this is what I want to do you, you, you said you have had enough okay go back to Damascus and anoint this prophet to replace you so how the call took place Elijah appeared very abruptly. You don't really know a lot about his past. You know his father's name and you know where the province where he is from. That's all you know about him. So then on the next slide, you will find that Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field. And Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. You know, sometimes you will see pictures of Elisha uh, plowing with 12, <laughs> 12 pair of, uh, of, of oxen. That, that would not be possible. You need to be Superman to do that. So he was part of a team of workers. Uh, we, we don't know. We assume that he was maybe the owners of that because he decided to kill it at the end. So I, I guess if, if, if the uh, oxen don't belong to me, I will not kill it, I decide to kill it. So, so we assume that he was probably a quite well-to-do farmer because these 12 oxen, either they were like a community of farmers working together or the, f the father and, and Elisha were well-to-do and these were workers working in the field together for the father. But he was pretty successful in his field of work. So he, he, he did not notice the prophet Elijah walking in his field because he was very busy, you know, when you are working with animals in a field that, that requires all of your strength and attention. Eleven pairs of oxen were his servants and he himself was guiding the twelfth pair. So when he saw Elijah, he probably wondered, what, what was that all about? Why is Elijah here? First of all, we don't know if he had ever met Elijah, if he knew that this man was, is he Elijah? We, we don't know a lot of things about the, the, the things. But in the next slide, you will see what happened. Elijah went over to him and just threw his mantle across his shoulders and then walk away. So without a single word, he does say, oh, hi, are you Elisha? La, la, la. How are you? God sent me here and this is a special moment for you. Let me do this. Let me do that. This is the significance of what I'm doing. No, he just walked put his, his clock over his shoulder, just walk away. That, that's, that's a bit uh, strange. He simply threw the mantle of the Lord over his Elisha's shoulders. He didn't say anything. He just flung his garment of skin over. That was enough. And at this moment, we assume that uh, uh, some time of a divine moment took place. This is a, a great change that takes place in it. He probably felt a sense of God's presence. We don't read it in the text how he felt, but you can imagine the scene. This is very unusual. You, you're doing your task, your daily task, and then this strangely dressed, wild, prof, wild looking prophet, like scruffy and everything, comes and put his maybe not so clean garment over your shoulder and then, uh, yeah. Maybe there were no deodorant in these, these years. <laughs> so anyway, he felt, he felt something special at that time. And that, some sense of an anointing, a sense of God's presence, and a sense of calling. Uh, 
And that signified two things. The fact that he had this mantle over him, so he said, you come with me today and you will replace me. That is what he's having. And look, think also about the uh, uh, attitude of Elijah. Elijah was the man of God for how many years now and in very dangerous situation. And here is God is saying, okay, I'm replacing you. And many times when there is a time of transitions and times of calling, even in, in church life, there's, you know, sometimes spirits of divisions, spirits of competitions, fear of being replaced, uh, you know, this kind of a feeling, envy, jealousy, fear, grudges. You find nothing of that kind in Elijah. He goes to Elisha and he does it exactly like he was instructed by the Lord. And then he walked away and he did not expect anything. He just walked away. And then Elisha react to that. And then on the next slide you will see what's happening here. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and says, Please let me kiss my father and my mother and I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again. What For what have I done to you? What have I done to you? And that's the title really that is struck to me. What have I done to you? What has God done to you? That's the questions that we will try to answer this morning. Elijah is reminding of that divine connection, the special moment, the symbolism of what he has just done. He has passed out a task from God, a calling from God, without even explaining just like a divine moment, an encounter between the, pro the old prophet calling the replacement prophet. And then, what have I done? Think about that. Because he says, let me go back to my parents, say goodbye, kiss my mother, my father, then I will come back to you. Okay? Do it, but think about what I have done to you. For what have I done to you? So keep that in mind, this question is very important for each one of us today. For what have I done to you? Consider what's happening. Elisha could see the fields that he worked it for I don't know how many years. His job, his work, his conditions, his office, or whatever it is, his schools, or whatever it is where God meets you. This moment in time when you are do, doing your daily task as a father, as a mother, as a worker, as a student, as an asylum seeker, as, as a domestic helper, as a teacher, whatever you are here for in your company. God has a divine moment for you and he's telling you, think about what I have done to you. God is calling each one of us. So he look at his job, he looks at what he has been used to do, and he knew his life was over. If you look at verse 21, the next one, Elisha returned back from him, from Elijah to his parents and back. And he took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the town people and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. That's, in fact, that's a very short story if you look at the, the details of it. There's not a lot of, you know, things. But it's, it's a life-changing uh, things. Think about Elisha. This moment has turned a farmer, an obscure farmer that lives in the whatever province he is from, son of a farmer, and to a prophet. Did you know that Elisha is mentioned as the man of God the most in the old Bible? Th that has this title, man of God, attached to his name. 31 times, more than Moses, more than everything. I'm not saying that he was more important. I'm saying that the term man of God attached to Elisha. He has served God for 60 years. Many kings over and all sorts of situations and dangers. And he has been very, very near to poor people, to widow, to, to uh, normal people. And he is the prophet that is compared the most to the Lord Jesus Christ for the type of miracles, his attitude and his, connect, his, his ability to connect to people in the type of miracles. He has the double amount of miracles than Elijah. So this special moment 
where the mantle of Elijah was placed upon his shoulder was a very important moment. And that moment of you, when God calls you for whatever time he does and whatever ways he will choose to do it and he has done, should have brought significant transformation in your life as well. Because for think about what I have done to you. Amen? Hallelujah. So he returned after saying goodbye to his parents and a small crowd of people that gathered. And after slaughtering his oxen and cooking the meat, he, he, he feeds his friends and everything. But that we will see later on that this even gesture is not only a, 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 like a picnic or a barbecue. It's, it's a more, much more significant uh, moment in the life of Elisha and the life of his calling. So we'll go to the next slide and we will look at what type of lessons we can learn from the amazing story of Elisha. So we will probably run out of time this morning, so don't worry, we'll stop and then we'll continue another time. Elisha was an unlikely person to be called to special service. We will just read these ones and then we will go one by one. His call was clear and definite. He received his call while he was faithfully working he did not try to enter God's service until God called him. He was called to a difficult work. He received God's special equipment for service. And Elisha responded to God's call with a wholehearted surrender. Let's look at number one. Elisha was unlikely, an unlikely person to be called. I guess that in this room here, you all identify with that one. Unlikely to be called by the Lord. Me? Who am I? <laughs> like I'm just this ordinary person from this ordinary place doing this ordinary job and uh, whatever it is. Um, so so we, we feel, we feel li like that. And re realize there were at this time of this calling 100, at least 150 students or prophets in the school of prophets. We, we know in the reading a bit in the first and second king, second king especially, there was a school of prophets and there were at least 150 people. And uh, so why God has chosen a farmer? Why not go to the Bible seminary? Why not call someone who has been studying for four years? Or someone who has already bear the title prophet because they were prophets or sons of prophets and they were already engaged in a school, in a national school of training for prophets. And God sends Elijah to a farmer. So why, why does God do things like that? And he, also he didn't find uh, Elijah like praying, fasting, and reading his, his Bible or the Torah or something like this, he finds him just blowing a field. So, so you don't see why we cannot understand. And many times when we look at ourselves or look at this story, it says, I don't understand why God has chosen this particular uh, person instead of this. But this is um, not to, to put down leadership training or theological education. This is important and the more you get of every type of training, it will benefit you at some point in your study and your interpretation of scriptures, it will benefit you. But it, what we, we, we underline here is that to God, there is something above that. This is far greater than a degree, far greater than four years in the Bible school. It's the heart. It's what God knows about you. It's not about the, the skillful sets, the diploma that you have, but about how much God knows you and knows the potential that he sees in you and knows in advance the plan that he has for you. It's about the heart and all this. And we find it and many other people also. Look at the next, uh, just click. And then you will see Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Gideon, was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it. Uh, David, he chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. Amos, I am no prophet, nor am I a prophet's sons, for I have been shepherding and picking fruit of the sycamore trees. So it seems that God has a special heart for, for simple people because he looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the skill set, social skill set, and the social status that, that we have. Look at Jesus when he first chose his apostle. 
uh, he, he, he didn't go to the king and look for soldiers and uh, big people. They were a poor lot when Jesus met his apostles. They made a lot of mistakes. That's why we like to read the gospel. You look at, at, at their lives and we, we can identify with them. They all forsook Jesus and fled at the time of Jesus' greatest need. But after the Holy Spirit came upon them, these are not the same group of men that they had people before. So God sees in the calling, in our calling, what he can do if we welcome his Holy Spirit and let him work in our, in our lives. After the Holy Spirit sent down, they served him, they were loyal, they were fruitful, they did awesome things. So let me ask you a question. Has God chosen you? Has God called you? Yes! Yes, say yes. yes, yes, yes. Look at the next slide. The, 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 in the, the next slide. Look at this text. Remember, this is addressed to you and me this morning to remind you to, uh, about a very important truth. Dear brothers and sisters, remember that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy, when God called you. Does that make you feel good? Yes. yes, it makes me feel very good to read something like that. Why me, Lord? Why me? Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And He chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of the Lord. So, so God chose us as we are in our humility and our weaknesses and our lack of worldly wisdom. And he comes to us because he sees in our heart. And that's very, very important to us. Look, uh, if we click at the next one, something that I think is very important. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom. Christ made us right with God. And other Bible version says our justification. He made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, our sanctification. He freed us from sin, our redemption. So think about your calling. This is so glorious what God has done. This is what God has become to you, what God has done to you, and how, how important you are, and how important and significant the change that took place in your life. He has set you free from the bondage of your past sins. He has made you right and acceptable before God, which you didn't have before this access. He also gives you the Holy Spirit to sanctify you, help you to uh, overcome sin, walk in a way that is pleasing to Him, pure and holy in this life, so that you can serve Him, glorify Him, be pleasing to Him. And that is what your calling as so significant that the beginning of your calling the effect the impact of what Christ is doing with us can you go back to the last the 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 one yeah okay here second timothy 1 9 i just put it there because it's so clear he saves us and called us with a holy calling and this is addressed and the Bible to Christians. So it is addressed to you. So we cannot doubt about this important calling. He saved you and he called you with a holy calling. Can we say that together this morning? And we will use the me uh, as the pronoun. He saved me and called me with a holy calling. So that clears everything we have been called. So we have a lot to learn about the calling of Elisha. Let's go to the next point. Elisha's call was clear and very definite. God is the one who calls people. He's the director of his work. We are asked to ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers in his field. So when Elijah declared, think about what I have done to you, 
he wanted this young farmer to seize the divine moment, the life transforming moment. God was calling him into the ministry. This is also a very important for you and I, because if you don't have this assurance that God has called you to be say, a pastor, a missionary, think about uh, Pastor Vivian. In the last few weeks, she's been dealing with the demon-possessed young people among the Atas, about the sickness and disease of their skins, not having water. If you are not sure, I, I, I try to think of how she must feel overwhelmed. She has no time to finish a crisis. A, a, a worse crisis is coming on the other side. And it seems that it is endless because she's dealing with a tribe that are sometimes not helping themselves, or not educated, or not powerful enough in society to, to find their own way to, to help and to solve their own problems. So somebody must come alongside and do it. And it's not near. It's, it's about one hour distance every time by motorcycle or whatever it is. So I'm thinking about this. Sometimes she writes to us and asks some advice. And we, we've been like on Facebook Messenger with her. Sometimes we Skype together. We pray together with her. But it's like an endless, endless run to, to try to help someone all the time. So, so you need to have the, this. Because when you will be tried and tested and you're calling, if you don't have the assurance, that Jesus is with you and he has spoken like this mantle has been put on your shoulder and that God was the one calling you you will not you will not last very long you will not last very long in Acts chapter 13 as they ministered to the Lord and fasted the Holy Spirit says so then separate Barnabas and Saul to me for the work to which I have called them here in that case here you see a very very specific form of calling a vocal calling, the Holy Spirit spoke, this was public, it was called by name. For the task is already described, it's a clear thing. First of all, the calling took place in the heart for the task that I have already called them. So their prayers, they have heard the call of God, but the call of God comes. And I, I believe this is really something that we must practice. This is a principle in the book of Acts, Pastor Jennifer, I'm sure will develop it much more when she will get to that place. But that is a very important uh, place to this. So the different type of ways that God calls, either by name, but it will be publicly, or in, as in the case of uh, Timothy, we read to which you were called and about which you gave a good testimony in front of many witnesses. So also T Timothy was called, they were witnesses, he gave a, a testimony on the day of that things. So something happened public, it's clear. Timothy was being acknowledged. The body of Christ knew and uh, supported his calling and, and knew about it. Because when you are in the body of Christ, I believe this very strongly, when you, you see people that God is raising as, as, let's say, leaders, a potential for certain times of ministry. You see their characters. You see the fire in their heart. You see their testimonies. You, you see their ability. You see their skills. You see the, the, the talents, the, the calling. You recognize that the body of Christ has the, the power to see these things. So, so when God calls someone, because I have seen the opposite. I have seen also people calling themselves. I believe God is calling me. And I have seen people destroying themselves. I know a, a, a couple in Canada in our church. They had a farm. They had a buffalo farm. That was very unique. They were making money. They were doing fine. One day he decided that he is called to go to Mexico without the support of the church, without, uh, you know, uh, having proven, having been tested. The intention was good, the, 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 you know, the willingness was there, the excitement, the, the fire was there, they were really on fire. They sold their farm, they went to Mexico. They spent all of their money, they came back frustrated, angry, bitter, uh, demolished, because they had not received the support the financial support, I don't know, something didn't follow them because they were not uh, 
approved, I would say spiritually, by the body of Christ. Nobody had really seen them or approved of their, 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 their ministry. So when they left, they left on their own. There's another uh, guy that also similar like that. He left and he did a depression when he was there. He came back bitter. Everybody that they have seen that have left on their own, that have called themselves, they have come back either depressed, but they all came back bitter and demolished. And some of them are not in the Lord anymore. And some of them have finally come back to the Lord by God's grace. So it's very important to be called and to see the, 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 that confirmation. In the, in the case of Elisha, it was uh, uh, indirect. He received his call through, uh, we call it a commission. Uh, Elijah commissioned him. It was, he was a prophet, God sent him to commission. It's like almost like an ordination service. It's like we, we, we commission, we, we, we call you uh, to, to come on that. So that's a, another type. But it is either by name, but publicly, or by commission. Hallelujah. He received his call while he was faithfully working. Next slide. And this is very important to, to God. I believe that God will choose people who are devoted to something. They are devoted to their duties. They are taking their, their work and what they are doing seriously. They are responsible. They, they, they are accountable. They are loyal to what they do. Elijah did not find Elisha sitting down or having a snooze in the heat of the day under the tree. He found him plowing his field with 12 pairs of, as a group. That means skills. I don't know if you have ever tried to uh, uh, plow a field with a pair of oxen. Anybody has tried that here? Maybe, maybe somebody has tried it. But I, I think, I've, I've not having tried it, that it would require skills. I, I can imagine myself trying that, you know? You can, uh, you prepare laughing, everybody? If I try this, you know, I will trip over or whatever. Something horrible will happen to me. But uh, then you would all laugh at me. So, but this, this one, it was doing it skillfully and God came while he was working. So we have a few questions to ask you in this one here. If you feel that God leads you to missionary or pastoral work, are you doing your present job as unto the Lord? It's very important. If you do a secular job, you are still doing it for the Lord, isn't it? So if you don't have that sense, how, even though we would entrust you with some sorts of spiritual work, you know a lot of the spiritual work has a lot of secular responsibilities in it. You know, a pastor Jennifer, we are, we are here serving the church, we are pastors, but we change lights, uh, I, I, I pick up the toilet paper on the fourth floor at the end of the day, bring it back to the fourth floor. Like we do things like that as a, we call the contractors that to come and fix something, like whatever it has to do in the routine of the daily task. Uh, we have to do, not because we are spiritually uh, called to, do, to a ministry, we have a lot of tasks. There's a paper in the floor. You know, when you walk in the church on Sunday morning, you say paper on the floor. Me, I pick, I, I pick it up I, because I, I'm responsible. This is, this is the church I, I belong to. I want it to be clean. So, so we do, we do the, these little things. So it's very important. So if we cannot do these things in our regular jobs, we will not be very fit to do good quality work for the Lord. Are you punctual? Are you conscientious, respectful, and cooperative? You know, one of the, I heard one of the worst uh, complain for people in the ministry the hard one of the hardest things is to work with others in the ministry and uh, the the personality the conflict the tensions and the disputes that that comes so we are all in God's school uh, for the time being and we need to make the most of our training time amen Hallelujah. I have so many good things here to come, but I need to stop because it's time to stop. So we will, we will continue. <laughs> continue. Oh, you know, you know I, I, can, I can keep you here until 1 o'clock this afternoon if you want to, but maybe some people will not be so happy about that. <laughs> Hallelujah. But anyway, uh, we, we are at the beginning of this topic. There's so much more to, to say, so we will be able to continue. So I, I want to leave you with, with this thought. Go to the last, last slide, and then just think about that. 
think about what I have done to you. Would you stand, please? Hallelujah. Whether you are a new Christian or an old-timer, old as we say, the call of God is so unique and it's so powerful and it's so life-changing. But for some of us, I think we need to be refreshed about the call of God. Like, God called me for a purpose, but I've lost this uh, sense of the divine and this calling, and it has become just too familiar. So this morning I pray that the Holy Spirit will refresh. Think for yourself about what God has done to you.